Um, good morning, dear colleagues and guests, and also all who are following our event online. Uh, excuse me for a bit of delay. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the discussion we had uh, yesterday. I hope also that you have enjoyed uh, dinner yesterday. And today we will continue with the second plenary session, which is devoted uh, to the review of the corporate framework, aiming to find possible ways uh, forward in this regard. Uh, we already have started uh, quite extensively this discussion. Um, we started it yesterday and raised plenty of very good points and some possible approaches uh, to be applied in order to find perfect solutions or to make the situation uh, less imperfect. And um, I encourage everybody to participate today in the discussion on the future of the European Copyright Framework. And before we proceed with the presentations, I would like to remind of the time frame. Each speaker has 25 minutes for the presentation and then five minutes to answer a couple of questions. After 13 minutes uh, long coffee break at uh, 11.30 or maybe a bit later because of the late in the morning, we will have an extended panel discussion uh, with participation of all the speakers of the second plenary session. As regards the participation of the audience in the discussion, please let me remind you that uh, you will have a possibility to ask the question straight from your seat by raising your hand and you can send the questions to the email address uh, indicated on the agenda and also on the screen. So the last option uh, I think will be most useful for those who are following this event online, of course. And um, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Thomas Dreyer uh, to start with the first presentation. Uh, professor Thomas Dreyer uh, is Professor of Law at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, where he is a director of the Institute, uh, Institute for Information and Economic Law and honorary professor at the Law Faculty of the University of Freiburg, Germany. He has been an advisor to the European Commission, the Council of Europe and UNESCO on Copyright Matters. So please, Professor Dreyer, the floor is yours. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Mr. Gulbis, for the kind introduction. Um, before we even start with these heavily fundamental thoughts on thoughts and limitations and exceptions, I have to make two caveats. And the first one is that, after all, most of the presenters here were academics, and you are more or less practitioners, having your hands on the policy making. Now, academics somehow work in the cloud. Um, not the new uh, digital cloud, but somewhere detached. And they have the luxury that they can dream about an ideal world. So uh, I foresee lots of comments, Maria, from you about saying, but it's not politically feasible. <coughs> but nevertheless, I thought, and that's how we staged the three of us this morning session, that uh, before we enter into some details of what eventually could be done, um, some fundamental thoughts, some, some general ideas uh, should be communicated. Um, now, I'm not sure to what extent you're all familiar with this, but maybe you find on one or the other slide, you find something, something new. I hope it's not all uh, uh, already uh, in your mind. The second remark, of course, is the first speaker in the second morning, uh, implies to all speakers for the second day, have the tremendous disadvantage that the snowy landscape has already been quite trampled on. Uh, there is no blank area, and probably I'll have to come along some trodden paths uh, parties that we have done uh, yesterday as well. So what I want to do with you is basically um, start with a fundamental idea by saying before we even discussing any details of um, harmonizing the EU and before it's been decided how we should adapt the Article 5 of the InfoSoc, uh, some uh, fundamental considerations are to be called for in order to know what we are doing when we are doing it. 
And the third caveat I forgot is uh, my talk was written uh, and designed under the assumption that when we're talking about limitations and exceptions and a review of the InfoSoc, that basically we focus on Articles 5, 2, 5, 3 and how Articles 5, 2 and 5, 3 could be brought in line with today's digital requirements. Imagine, let's go back 15 years ago, 2001, we just had the World Wide Web. There was a famous telephone company called Nokia. Everybody had one. I'm not asking who still has one. Don't think they make them anymore. Well, you still have one. Good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Um, no peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Certainly no cloud computing. Nothing such as big data. Yet, of course, traditional industries, publishing, music industry, computer industry, etc. So that means that maybe we should go through Articles 5, 2, and 3 to see whether they are really up to the point. And that was my starting uh, perspective. In order to do so and get to the fundamentals, um, I would like to take you to two parts. The first part being, the, by a far bigger part, some general remarks on the role of limitations and exceptions in the copyright system. And then just as one example, I take out the exceptions applying to museums to kind of give you an idea how I think, in my limited academic view, how possibly uh, a remastering, a reviewing of Article 5, 2, and 3 could uh, proceed. Now let's start with this first bigger part, some, the general uh, role of limitations and exceptions. And uh, because it's a longer part, I show you here the five points I want to mention. First of all, some brief remarks, what are these? Exceptions and limitations. Yesterday we did not distinguish between the two. We always refer to limitations and exceptions. And I think, at least linguistically, there is a big difference, or you might read a big difference into limitations and exceptions, which play a major role. Then, of course, we have to look to some economics because that's what copyright is about, let's face it. It's about authors, yes, and personality rights, but it is, of course, also about economics. And I uh, have a particular problem with recital nine of the InfoSoc Directive. And, of course, yesterday we have heard the important role article, uh, recital nine plays with regard to interpretation uh, mechanisms by the Court of Justice. Um, of course, uh, a brief view about uh, review options. That is probably a, a part which is, is, is under complex because yesterday we had much many more options already discussed, so we can probably briefly skip over that. Uh, I will nevertheless present you my ideas on flexibility which add on to what we said yesterday. And then in the end I have another point which we didn't even touch upon yesterday, and that's the relation between exceptions, limitations, and contracts and technological uh, protection measures. So let's take the first point, the difference between exceptions and limitations. Um, are these actually two things? Are there two categories of legal animals assembled in Article 5? Um, are they the same? Are they different? I think, but Jonathan may correct me, uh, I think that from a German perspective the wording is ambiguous. To my reading, exception, Ausnahme, reads more like a deviation from a general rule, whereas limitation, in my understanding, goes to the definition of the boundaries of the rule itself. Now that is a big difference. How is it, for example, the effects of the difference would be, one effect would be, if it's an exception to a general rule, then I could say, well, if it's an exception, then it's only in exceptional cases that this exception applies. Therefore, we, we interpret it rather narrowly. However, if you come to the point to have the understanding of a true limitation, that it limits from, right from the start the scope of protection, then the rule that there should be a narrow interpretation doesn't make sense because it's just a part of the definition, an integral part of the definition of the rule itself. So I think we should make sure what we are talking about. And if you're getting to the economics, I want to show you that the understanding of exception in the first sense, just a mere cutting off of the general rule, is probably the wrong approach, the wrong way of looking at exceptions. And in this respect, um, 
what I want to show you is some sort of basic economics. And you know, economics, they love these graphs. One factor in relation to the other. And what we do is, and I said, you see, it's, it's a co-author uh, thing with uh, Ian McKay from, from Canada. Uh, he had the one idea, he had the basic idea, and I kind of combined it with the famous recital 9 of the InfoSoc directive. So therefore, it's a true work, I think, of co-authorship. At least he has, we had an email exchange, and he has never complained that I use his basic uh, uh, underline. So we start here, and we have on the uh, vertical line the amount of creativity innovation. Now it's a very simplified drawing, so you could say it's the actual amount, it's the incitement to create. Um, it's a little bit flu, but that's creativity on this line. And here we have the scope of uh, protection. Now, does that have a pointer? Yes, it does. So the idea is here there would be zero protection. And there, the, the more we go down that line, the stronger protection becomes. The more rights are added, the less exceptions. And this is the resulting creativity. Now, um, very simplified, let's assume that if there would be no copyright protection, comp uh, create, there would be no creativity at all. Of course, we know that in reality, even then, this point would be sli slightly higher up that line because there is some creativity around irrespective of whether there's copyright or not. But for the simplification, let's just assume, and you'll probably see that it's not important whether I fix that cross down here or a little bit uh, further up. Let's assume that is no zero, zero scope and then no creativity. Then we have another point. Um, Wait a minute, how is it? See, that's the disadvantage of, you always forget how it's, uh, how it's uh, animated. Um, what does that mean with regard to recital nine of InfoSoc Directive? Recital nine reads, only high protection is good protection. So, although Andan yesterday said it says high, not higher, I have always understood the high protection that probably it means the more protection you get, the better it is for creativity and innovation. What does that mean? Well, you can see the, can make the math. It gives you a straight line like this. The more protection you have, the more creativity goes up. You might even say it goes right through the roof. The more protection, the better. Now, already now you might think there, can, well, there must be something wrong with it. And I'll show you what's wrong with it. Let's assume we have a very high protection. Let's assume copyright law, it says, whoever utters a word for the first time has the absolute right to license anybody who uses that word again. It clearly becomes visible that at this point in time, if we have such protection, creativity is down to zero because nobody could make a public speech anymore or we had tremendous licensing cost. If you go with me that far and say, okay, with all due generalization here and generalization there, that's the case. And if you do believe that the scope of protection that copyrighted all does have an impact on creativity, then the curve of effectiveness must necessarily look like the red curve. It's zero or low or low here, it's low there, and if it does something in the middle, then there must be some sort of a high point. Now, whether it's a parable or whether it has another form, that's of no importance. The only point is there is some optimum point in the middle which then gives us the appropriate point of scope of protection. We should go from here to there and not further because we go any further, innovation is stifled. Well, that means that's our exclusivity, the amount of exclusivity, the scope of protection we want to get. Now what happens with regard to, and that's the scope of protection, that the rights minus the exceptions. Now what happens if we start our laws with a very broad exclusive right, such as Article 2? Any reproduction, however short, is subject to copyright. Then it is clear this is over protection, and therefore we do have some limitations in Articles 5.1 to 5.3, which kind of cut back ideally to that optimal point so that after having cut back, we get exactly what we want. 
So bottom line, you see, the exceptions, in my view, are an integral part of defining the scope of the law. And hence, of course, they no longer, they define the boundaries, and they are not mere exceptions to a broad rule, and therefore the sentence, or what the court says that they have to be narrowly interpreted, is, well, to take blunt words, it's just plain bullshit. It's ideological bullshit. You could argue that if you place yourself on the point that all you're interested in is very broad control interests for authors. But that's not the whole story because we want more creativity. We want to incite and stifle, uh, we wanted to incite uh, creativity. So that was the, the idea why I think that uh, limitations have to be looked at at limitations rather than exceptions in this respect. And of course, the traditional argument that, um, that uh, uh, now I call go back to exceptions and limitations because that's what's uh, written in the uh, directive, that they do fulfill certain purposes in the uh, public interest and it always occurred to me as something very special. Why place higher emphasis on the property interests and why plays much less interest and much less uh, emphasis on the public interest. I think it's a true balancing effect of two interests which are of equal, uh, of equal uh, footing. Um, we'll, we'll see below uh, when we get to the discussion of waivability and the uh, section on, uh, on the details uh, what, how that could be made uh, uh, operational. Um, so, uh, if we then look to the next point, the question of general options, uh, I told you this is um, somewhat uh, sub-complex uh, uh, because uh, Maria Martin Pratt has already yesterday uh, lined out uh, several other options we could do. Uh, basically, I was talking by saying, well, of course, we could retain the limited optional catalog, then there would be no harmonization. We could go to the smallest common denominator and make that mandatory, which would probably be uh, that it's uh, too restrictive. My idea I would uh, like to draw your attention to is the, the adequate list of exceptions according to its purpose. Uh, and uh, if you remember, the, the Witten proposal tried to structure the existing uh, exceptions uh, and bring them under the four general purposes and then eventually uh, deduct certain differentiation with regard to treatment according to these uh, purposes. Um, I'm not talking more about it because I think discussion yesterday was far more advanced. Uh, we introduced, talked about the model that some exceptions could be mandatory and not others, that we could uh, decide uh, between exceptions that have a, an effect within the internal market and others that would only work more locally. Uh, just perhaps one thought that occurred to me yesterday where we said, yes, all the Internet, all exceptions invariably have a cross-border effect. Well, that's true. That's academically that's true. Theoretically that's true. But then the question arises, how come that there are so few cases where this question is tested? Think about the famous um, uh, public, the, the copyright exception for uh, public documents we have in Germany. We take it out of the scope of rights and never consider it as something that should master the test of 5.2, and 5.5. There was once a case brought up to the, uh, Supreme, uh, to the ECJ. I think the case was later on withdrawn. Uh, nobody has ever heard anything about it. And public documents are distributed in Germany and they can be called and downloaded in France, in Belgium, in Greece. No German right holder, no foreign right holder has ever made a point and a fuss about it. So the question is, how real is this uh, problem we have uh, with regard to uh, these uh, limitations that have a transborder effect? It's just a thought that maybe one could integrate into the idea about the importance of tackling problems which are transborder problems of limitations and exceptions. Maybe the, the problematic isn't as big as one, as one might think. Next point, flexibility, uh, discussed at great length with two opposing views between Silk on the one hand and uh, Martin uh, on the other, carefully staged. Uh, I am, needless to say, I'm also uh, of the opinion that, yes, we do need it in times of fast technological 
uh, development. We need some flexibility. Uh, I think the, the, the safety valves used by national courts clearly demonstrate there is a need to find solutions uh, because otherwise um, the socially and economically desirable access and reuse will be hindered or, as we said, the courts will create their own uh, safety um, uh, valves. Um, entrusting the ECJ with that task, I don't think it's a proper solution unless we assume that, yes, the ECJ will also look for safety valves. Um, uh, I'm not sure that's the, the correct way. What I'm focusing on is what kind of possibilities do we have apart from using already built-in flexibilities? And of course, the first one uh, was the, the fair use US style. We discussed that yesterday. Um, it might bring about sufficient legal security uh, in the US. Um, and here, I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm, Silke, I'm, I'm with you as long as we don't have all this kind of huge amount of, of case law, that body of case law in EU, we'll be basically starting back at zero, and that will create maximum insecurity. And I don't think we should, uh, I don't think we should adopt fair use US style. Also, because some of the exceptions that are covered by the um, fair use US style, we have them explicitly laid down in much greater detail already in 5.2 and 5.3, so therefore it would be a very muddled scenario going for an overall general flexibility uh, such as fair use. Also, I think politically it would be near impossible to sell uh, an import from the US into Europe uh, in that way. Uh, in literature, I often refer, what about fair dealing in the UK? Uh, now, Jonathan, you can uh, tell me whether I'm right or wrong. It was always my perception that fair dealing is, first of all, it's a misunderstanding that it really corresponds to fair use because it's very limited. It's limited to specific uh, cases. And don't, let's not forget, it's, as I said, it, it's only a national idea of what's considered fair. There might be other ideas. Amongst one of the differences is that in the UK, there is a much greater emphasis placed on individual licensing than in other states. For example, using texts for school books and for university teaching is something which in the UK traditionally as well as in the US goes by licensing, collective licensing, but by licensing, whereas we have exceptions for this. So it's a totally different philosophy uh, underlying. Um, Martin basically uh, uh, pointed the way how we could uh, work and uh, he mentioned the Whittem approach without name mentioning Whittem uh, and the idea was that let's not have an overall uh, an overall uh, um, a completely open norm as suggested in the draft Reda report but because that might eventually really be too wide and open up doors one couldn't see the, the contours uh, of uh, but rather let's go to a uh, much more fine-grained flexibility by saying whenever you have certain cases which look rather similar to exceptions you have, which produce economically similar effects to that what has already been exempted, that in these cases national courts uh, might be empowered to use that flexibility. And I think if, if we do keep the flexibility to this limited amount, then a competition of national states and national state court uh, decisions is uh, not, a major, not a major problem. Because then these differences will arise, they will be discussed. The real important ones will end up with the ECJ and the other ones which are of a local nature will invariably stay at a local nature. But they are small and minor uh, additions with regard to flexibility. So in all, uh, let's opt, that will be my idea for a cautious flexibility, but please do introduce some sort of flexibility. Next point we haven't, and I think that's the, uh, that's the, uh, one of the last points I'm having, are limitations and exceptions versus contracts. Um, the point is to what extent should uh, there be an exception from the, an exception from the exclusive uh, rights by a limitation or exception, and to what extent in what cases should 
the question of use, access, etc., be negotiated by a licensing contract. And here it's what the economists tell. It's a, a question between public choice and private ordering. To what extent has, uh, does the public legislator say, we want certain acts being exempt from commercial dealings? Because that's what basically a limitation says. A certain use, such as a citation, is not an object you can negotiate, you can deal in, you can pay for. It's taken out of commerce. That's what the true exception, what it does. And the public choice will be, yes, we consider as a legislator, we consider it so important that we want to have it out of the commercial sphere, and therefore we craft that sort of exception. And the opposite view would be, well, what does the legislator know about markets? Nothing. Let the markets decide. Let private ordering decide. Uh, interestingly enough, that problem haunts us since the first uh, legal document, European legal document, of the, in the digital age. If you go to Article 5.1, and I listed all these, 5.1 computer programs, it says a legitimate user may do certain acts provided it's within the purpose of the use of the program. So a legitimate user, that's someone which is subject to contract. For the purpose of it, of, of using the program, the purpose can be defined in the contract. So there's a strange mixture of uh, contractual and limitational, exceptional uh, construction, and you know that the courts have taken long time to find out whether there is some core right embedded in Article 5.1, which cannot be contracted away. And finally, the EU, in the SAS case, I think it was uh, said that, yes, there is such a core which is not subject to, to licensing. But it's not very clear where the boundary line runs in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this provision. And similarly, you have a, uh, another provision for databases, although it's, it's much more limited in scope and never really one never found out why is there a difference. Uh, in the InfoSoc we have, for example, for library terminals, we have a different one where it basically says, unless there has, has a valid contract has been concluded. Now that's a very strange animal. We have an exception unless there's a contract. Well, we never found out, and the uh, Eugen Ulmer case couldn't dissolve it. Uh, how do we apply that in practice? <laughs> Uh, libraries say, well, we didn't conclude a contract, so therefore we're allowed to do it freely. Publishers said, yeah, but we offered you a contract. And they said, yeah, but we didn't conclude it. The publisher now left at limbo with the Eugen Ulmer case, but saying, yeah, but if we offer, what, could we, what more could we do if the others have no obligation to accept an adequate offer? Then this kind of restriction, unless there's a contract, is meaningless. So it, it shows you, all I want to show, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is this overlap between limitations, exception, and contract, and that it is all but clear. There is no common theory. Remember famous Article 644, whenever content is made available online, then with regard to technical protection measures, you never have a right to circumvent them and make use of your limitations. So limitations are completely overridden with regard to online access to databases. Why is that the case? Um, no clear concept here, and I think we should think about how uh, the system should work properly. Uh, it goes even a step further. There's only limited unwaverability. You see, not even all of these uh, clauses and others uh, are made uh, um, unwaverable. So there's a total lack of underlying, underlying concept. Uh, what could be the, the, the guiding lines for such a concept be? Uh, and I would say uh, one of the possible solutions is, of course, leave it all to the invisible hand by saying, let the market decide. And let's only correct by way of legislation once there is market failure if contract lead to monopolies, oligopolies, etc. If there's market distortion. It has something for it. It has something for it in that you do an ex post correction, you correct ex post something which you couldn't foresee how things would develop. The problem is, it's only ex post, so the damage has already been done. Um, therefore, you could perhaps differentiate between standard terms and conditions and individually negotiated restrictions by saying, well, we place primary importance on the contract, 
however only in situations where there is an, an equivalent of bargaining power. If there's a structural imbalance, such as usually is the case with standard terms, we would place public policy in the first place. Or you could differentiate according to the purpose of the exceptions. If there's a strong public view, freedom of expression, uh, etc., freedom of the arts, you could say then public choice takes it, and if there's a weaker access, such as public libraries and licensing, uh, we eventually might say let's let's contract, let's have the people contract it out. Date, data and text mining, for example, is such an example where I'm of the opinion that we should not run rush too quickly to an exception, but why not let the parties try to find out what might be a proper licensing solution? They could then start with contracts, for example, on a, with a sunset provision, contracts which run only for half a year or a year to find out whether the mechanisms they've, they thought and the equilibrium of interest, whether they are okay and whether the parties got it right. And if not, the parties themselves can correct it for them and it's not the legislator who kind of imposes a public choice solution which may or may not be uh, the, the correct one. Um, in any rate, um, I'm not sure whether it says declare more exceptions unwaivable, but you could do that if you want to strengthen uh, a public uh, a policy. However, you should make it more clearly visible which of the exceptions cannot be signed away. Um, and that is something, uh, Maria, I think that, in my opinion, which could easily be done, or more easily be done than right now, uh, where only some of the limitations are declared unwaivable, unless you say, okay, that's the core minimum we want to have, and for the rest we don't, uh, we don't decide. Um, just to uh, conclude, okay, well, the last one is, of course, you can also have any combination of all of these uh, above. Uh, the sky's the limit here for possible uh, solutions. We have a similar problem with regard to, um, uh, with regard to technical uh, protection measures, uh, some reason I say the, the courts seem to have a blind eye on that problem. What do I mean by that? Read, for example, the Swenson and also the Bestwater case, where it is said, as long as there are no technical protection measures, linking is okay. Now, if you turn that around, it means as soon as a private party puts some technological protection measure around, then, what then? then we are not in the realm of Article 6 technological protection measures, we are infringing Article 3, the public communication right. So it's a protection, an anti-circumvention protection generated by law parallel to Article 6. Now you remember that in Article 6 we have a careful balancing between access and proprietary interests which are totally pushed aside, not even discussed in this line of reasoning. And uh, therefore, um, I would say that we should kind of attack that problem and, and kind of find some, some solution. Um, the one solution would be we should incite the use of technical protection measures because that leads to product diversification, price differentiation, etc., and perhaps a better consumer satisfaction because more consumers can have access um, and you would really kind of remodel the shift from having to accessing, which Jeremy Rifkin, in his book, already 10 years old, uh, has so aptly uh, described. Another possibility would be, of course, to exclude private ordering via TPM altogether, as has been suggested by the Rida report. But actually here, with all due respect to Ms. Rida, uh, I'm not sure that's the correct way, because that means that you give out of hand a possibility and a means of structuring digital goods and services in a way so that they can better serve the market demand. But that's, of course, only my opinion. So now comes the much shorter part to conclude, the much shorter part three. Just one example how the review strategy could, in my view, eventually function, leave political issues aside. Uh, and I think that uh, will be my suggestion, uh, start with a purpose-oriented review that is 
craft the exception so that they fulfill the particular purpose they have initially been designed for, that they do that also in the digital environment. And I just show you one tiny, tiny example, yet I think it's an important example, important because it demonstrates uh, my way of proceeding, and that is, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, museums, they may advertise exhibition and store um, advertisements, but uh, store in the sense of analog storing, but they may not make historic advertisements publicly available online. There is a, is a gap in Articles 5 to C, reproduction, and the online here, because online means you're only allowed to do it to advertise the exhibitions. You cannot make the advertisement later on available online. Which means that museums, once they have an exhibition, and if you, you, you see them in front of your eyes, they always have like a little, a little description what the exhibition was about. They have one or two pictures. They tell you about the information, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, symposia were going on, etc. That is all online for advertising. And once the exhibition is over, they have to get it offline. So if you want to see and remember, there was an exhibition at the Rijksmuseum two or three years ago, and you want to see, well, what, what was it? What was the name of the author who had that written that particular article? You just can't find it on the net because museums are no longer able to store it. So in this respect, in a certain way, museums can no longer fulfill the role as memory institutions they are supposed to fulfill. So here I think we do have a clear case of adjusting an existing legislation. And you could muster through then all exceptions that are currently listed uh, according to these kind of, uh, strat uh, with this kind of strategy. Um, nevertheless, we should not lose sight uh, out of potential demand for new additional exceptions. And I'm just making mentioning two uh, one of them you know, and the other ones you might not know. In art history, um, the people who look into the sharing of images on social networks, including images on smartphones, they uh, conclude that what takes place is not a reproduction, making a reproduction and sending the reproduction to someone but rather it amounts to the gesture of, hey, I saw something interesting, look over there, look at this picture. And then you look at it, except that on our smartphones in order to communicate that message, hey, look at this picture, in order to communicate it, I have to kind of make it available to you, and there is a reproduction in the memory of your smartphone. But you might argue this is accidental, and none of the kids who plays around that way thinks of having made a reproduction they can use. They don't even object that this image disappears after a while. Uh, so the idea might be that you could create a new exception for non-commercial sharing of pictures, just because it is more socially like a, ge a gesture of showing and reproduction making available is just something which is accidental. Just, just a thought. And of course the next one is transformative use, non-commercial transformative use in social media. I think that is something that could be made copyright free. However, it's different if you get so successful that you participate in the advertising proceeds of Google. Then you're entering the commercial sphere, and then we are playing in a different league. And of course, you could dream up any other uh, new exception you might wish to look for. Uh, and then uh, another point already mentioned also by Maria, it's probably not necessary to extend all analog exceptions into to digital uh, uses. That's what you refer to technological neutrality. Uh, just because there was an exception, the analog doesn't mean we don't have it in the digital and uh, not even the, the other way around because we have to look what is the purpose and the effect of that particular exception. So to conclude, to conclude, um, I made a list of the don'ts <laughs> and that applies to all you lawmakers, what you shouldn't do. Now let's see what I could dream up. Uh, do not reduce them as far as possible. Uh, do not uh, accept the lowest common denominator because that would create, uh, make the limitations too small. Uh, do not retain the closed list, provide for some flexibility. And uh, do not 
make all exceptions subject to unlimited contracting and or technological protection measure because I think there's a sufficient public interest which at least for certain areas, some of them undisputed citation rights for example, uh, would mean that these uh, issues, these exceptions and limitations could not be made subject to unlimited contact or the use of technical protection measures. Now, what are the do's then? Well, there is the summing up of the big point. Uh, consider that limitations, exceptions are actually more limitations rather than mere exceptions, that they are the core issue of fine-tuning where the dividing line between the proprietary and the non-proprietary sphere runs. And why is that the case? I think because copyright at all, after all, because it incorporates that kind of delimitation of the copyright-free zone as well, Therefore, copyright, view, copyright law, in my view, is a law which not only has to deal with authors, but it deals with the whole communication process. That is not to say that I would go as far as saying that users have proper exclusive rights, or rights in the legal sense. That's still an imbalance, but the system of law as such, because of the importance of the limitations, uh, kind of have the access rights and the user rights with on board, and therefore copyright is, in my view, and uh, Martin has uh, said the same thing yesterday, uh, is, is in my view a communications law in the, in the broader, uh, broader sense. And of course, uh, do adapt exceptions, limitations to digital needs according to the purpose uh, of the exception. We have then as the next uh, 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 do's, the create some room for flexibility, uh, not US style fair use, but on a more smaller scale flexibility and do state clearly which rights can be contracted away and the faculty and define the faculty uh, for technological protection measures to decide which of the uses could be privatized where before they were under a public choice decision made freely available. And that is what I wanted to suggest to you as fundamental. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much for the comprehensive analysis and uh, we do not have um, much time but maybe one question from the audience and then later on we can ask more questions uh, during the discussion part of the session. So, one question. Okay, I think then we can proceed with the discussion later on. And now I, we have a bit change in order of uh, speakers and um, I would like to invite Professor Valérie Laure-Benabou, uh, who is Professor of Private Law at the University of Versailles, Director of the Master Degree at the NTCI IT Law since 2002. Professor is an author of a PhD on copyright and European law and <coughs> various studies and articles on the subject in French and international publications. So, so. The floor is yours, please. Uh, wow. Tough, tough, tough work. Speaking after yesterday afternoon and just after Thomas Dreyer's fantastic presentation is uh, quite a challenge. So, um, some of my speech will a little bit overlap what uh, has, ju has just been said by Thomas, but I will maybe propose some other view um, and how we can solve some of uh, the problems we have at the moment with exceptions. Uh, maybe by going backwards to, uh, I, don't, I don't have the, uh, oh yeah. Going backward to uh, the questions of competence and the acquis communautaire that we have uh, seen yesterday, um, how those two questions can help us to make uh, a future for exceptions. Uh, seeing the past is sometimes very um, useful to go ahead. So I'm going to go backward a little bit and try to explain or to see how 
all the points we have on the competence and the uh, respective competence of the EU and of the member states may help us to delineate the relevant scope for the EU level exception and maybe the relevant scope for member states exceptions because there might be this kind of flexibility which is not a substantial flexibility but uh, an institutional flexibility as um, recasting the, the separation between the EU level exceptions and the national exceptions. And the second point I want to make, but very shortly, that uh, if we do consider to have a new exception, we have to make a kind of test, an assessment uh, of the need for exception and the, the response that we might uh, answer to this need. Some elements have already Already, already been said, and you see, I say, see Severine Dussolier because we have been discussing that at large, and she will uh, make it uh, very uh, brightly, I assume, just after my presentation. And the third point, which is uh, also online with what uh, um, Thomas just said, is that. After the assessment for the need of exception, once you have chosen to have an exception, then you have to uh, be consistent with this choice, meaning that you have to make sure that uh, the um, exception is effective and that you provide uh, a real benefit for the user and that there will be no impediment in the legislation of copyright, but in other legislation or through TPMs or through contract or through other uh, elements that would impede the effective exercise of the benefit slash right of the user. So those are my three main uh, points. So why are we there uh, as regards exception? Uh, and I'm going to go back to the historical uh, background of the um, competence uh, as to copyright. As you recall it, well, uh, EU was reluctant to intervene in the field of copyright because, first of all, the Treaty of Rome had no cultural dimension. There was no specific provision uh, unless uh, the Article uh, 36 which was an exception to free movement of, uh, of goods and services. Uh, the status of property, Article uh, 345, state that the treaty shall not in no way prejudice the rules in member state governing the system of property ownership. All those elements that were uh, historically thought as an impediment for the EU to intervene in the field of copyright. That was a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, we, have, we have overcome all those uh, um, uh, elements in order to have uh, 12 or nearly 13 uh, directives on the road. What is the competence for uh, the EU to intervene in the field of copyright and a fortiori in the field of the exception for copyright? Um, there are fields for exclusive uh, competence. In Article 3 of the uh, Treaty of the Functioning of the EU, it is said that the Union shall have exclusive competence uh, in the following areas, establishing the competition rules necessary for the functioning of the internal market and common commercial policy. Common commercial policy has been defined in Article 207 with an, uh, that was not the case previously, but now it encompasses the commercial aspects of intellectual property. So commercial aspects of, international, of intellectual property are common commercial policy, which is normally an exclusive competence of the EU, meaning that if an exception is somewhat related to commercial aspects of international intellectual property it might be the exclusive competence of the EU. We have shared competence. I go really quick on that. Uh, shared competence in the area of the internal market, consumer protection, trans-European networks, areas of freedom, 
security and justice, okay, which is actually the basis on which uh, the directive are adopted and the basis on which exceptions are granted. Um, we have also this Article 6 uh, ground for intervention of the EU, which I would call subsidiary intervention, meaning it's not shared competence. The intervention here of the EU is just justified because there is a need for support coordination or supplement the actions of the member states. Meaning there, if the EU intervenes in this area, it is because there is a need for building all together elements. And what are the fields in which, I don't know if you see that properly, but the fields in which there is this uh, competence by default, I mean, uh, culture, education, vocational training, youth, and sport. So here also you have elements that might show us the way uh, for, uh, in which there, there might be a distribution of competence between the EU and the member states in order to regulate the fields for uh, exceptions. Um, not to say, sorry, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, there is also the competence uh, grounded on Article 118, uh, but as you know, we have not decided to uh, implement so far a regulation. So here it's not, I, I regret it actually, but it, it's not um, on the agenda uh, so far. So, uh, Let's go back a little bit um, on this um, article 207 on the uh, common commercial uh, policy. I just want to mention a very interesting decision of the uh, European Court of Justice in the uh, case Daichi Sankyo that has been rendered in the field of patent, uh, but it's really interesting because it has said, well, the question more or less was um, the compliance of uh, the EU law with the, the TRIPS agreement and uh, the possibility uh, uh, for us to uh, use directly the TRIPS uh, uh, provision. And um, as regards the validity of patent. And the, the, the recite, or the, the point, oh, I don't know, uh, 59, I'm going to read it because I think that you don't see the, the, the black thing. No, it's okay? Okay, the black, okay. So in this point, uh, 59, the court has stated that um, it remains altogether open to the European Union after the entry into force of the uh, treaty to legislate on the subject of intellectual property right by virtue of competence relating to the field of the internet market. However, acts adopted on that basis and intended to have validity specifically for the European Union will have to comply with the rules concerning the availability scope uh, uh, news of intellectual property rights in the TRIP agreement, as those rules are still, as previously intended, to standardize certain rules on the subject at world level and thereby to facilitate international trade. So my question is, my question is, oh, uh, 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 what does TRIP say about exception? Very quickly, uh, say nothing about exhaustion say uh, that uh, the objective of the treaty is to enforce the intellectual property right, but to the mutual advantage of, of producers and users of technological knowledge in a manner conductive to social and economic welfare and to a balance of rights and obligations. So there are principles, there are incentives in the TRIPS as to exceptions, uh, Article 8 state that uh, members may promote the public interest in sectors of vital importance uh, to their socio-economic and technological development. And there is this famous three-step test, Article 13. So uh, my question is, are all or some exceptions to copyright, part of the rules adopted by the European Union in the field of intellectual pro property, 
with a specific link to international trade, which would be capable of falling within the concept of commercial aspects of intellectual property, and hence in the field of common commercial policy, where only the EU will have uh, competence to rule over. Uh, as, regards uh, as regards competence, we have also to rem take in mind, bear in mind, the principle of subsidiarity and proportionality. Go very quick. So, conclusion on the competence. According to the competence system, there is a need for intervention at the EU level when the provision is linked to commercial aspects or to uh, competition's rules necessary for the functioning of the internal market. And then, well, we might say here, this is a place for harmonization, complete harmonization, and no place for local or member uh, national exceptions. There is a possibility of intervention of the EU within shared competence, internal market, consumer protection, trans-European network, where here you can say that in a directive, um, the, the EU might either choose, choose to make the choice to um, make a complete harmonization within this bill or to share what will the member state do and what the European uh, Union will, um, will, will say. Uh, there is also this possibility to support, coordinate or supplement the action of the member states in the field of culture or education. And uh, this is, might also be uh, an incentive for intervention because there is a, a call from the member states to enhance, to trigger a new exception that would be at the EU level because of the need of this co coordination between the different member states. Uh, let's may apply this uh, scheme, this framework. EU level exceptions related to commercial aspects of copyright and international trade. Example, Article 5.1. Well, it's already existing, but it absolutely, to my point of view, uh, comply with this framework. 5.1 is part of the international trade, actually. Maybe data mining if we think that it's relevant to have an exception, maybe data mining would fall uh, in this situation if there is supposedly a commercial aspect, but this is debate, uh, disputable. EU level for exception having an impact on the internal market, meaning that here we have to make maybe choices between the different exception, and that has been said already by Zilke, by Thomas, by defining the cross-border dimension of the exception and maybe selecting only in the new uh, revised directive this dimension of the exception, the cross-border dimension of the exception, and leaving to the member states the, same, the, the regulation of the same exception, which has no cross-border effect. Uh, elaborating a rule for the mechanism of compensation when the exception has a cross-border effect. We have not been discussing the compensation issue, which is a very important one, but we might think of an international private law rule, like in the Cable Satellite Directive, for designating the debtor of the compensation as regards different person involved in uh, a process of exchanging files between, I don't know, educational institution, museum, and so on. If there is a compensation that has been granted at the EU level, or <coughs> um, at, for the, for the e-lending system. And we can also say that we might uh, select some exceptions when there is a need for cooperation between the member states because we can, we, we try to build a common culture and we can maybe uh, encompass in, in those kind of exceptions, quotation, press, situation of the disabled because here we will, we'll, we'll have a, a common need uh, which would be the circulation of information and of culture uh, between the uh, citizens. 
Oh, I'm sorry, because I, I just to make... <laughs> so, right? Is it that? Yeah. Exceptions and the acquis, uh, very quickly. InfoSec Directive established a, li a limited list of facultative exceptions. We know that. Uh, we have a problem, we, s we said that. Yesterday, within the scope of the directive or in general, as you know, the InfoPAC decision has said that somehow the InfoSoc directive has become the common rule for copyright. But uh, what are the uh, consequences as regards the exception of this generalization of the concept uh, of the InfoSoc directive? Do, do we think that the list of exception is applicable to any work uh, software databases, even though we have specific directive which don't allow the same exceptions. So can we generalize the exceptions of the InfoSec directive to other works? Like for example, is a parody applicable to multimedia works? Because multimedia works they, ha they have some code, so there is some uh, software in the multimedia work, and there is no parody exception in the, in the software directive. So can we expand the field of, or shall we expand the field of the exceptions that are in the list of the directive as regards other works? So we definitely need a clarification of the scope of application of the exception as regard protected subject matter, and the uh, <clears throat> recast of the directive might be the, might provide for an opportunity to do that. Um, the, the, this limited list of voluntary exceptions mean that there is no possibility for member states to maintain or create exception out of the list. This is our minimum standard harmonization. But shall we stick to this principle or introduce national flexibility, meaning that we would let the member states willing to introduce more exception, or um, on the contrary, or suppress some exception from the InfoSoc list because they are, after uh, assessment, not relevant at the EU level. Introduce national flexibility would be possible through the modification of the uh, paragraph O of the actual directive. So for example, we can use it uh, for the uh, use in connection with the demonstration of repair and equipment, which to my, to my point is no cross-border, no problem of uh, cultural aspect that would need an EU level exception. Well, we use, well, uh, member states may uh, introduce exceptions for using certain other cases of minor importance, provided that they do not affect the free circulation of goods and services within the community, without prejudice to the others, exceptions and limitation contained in this article, and may be uh, subject to the three-step test. Maybe we can add the three-step test here, or just mention uh, the uh, Article 5.5 is also applicable. <clears throat> Last question with the Aki. Uh, InfoSoc Directive established a limited list of voluntary exception, meaning that member states have the possibility to choose between the exception. Shall we stick uh, to this? principle. We have been already saying that. No choice for member states, every exception for everyone, like uh, the Julia Reda uh, report or uh, proposal. Shall we, on the contrary, discuss a block of mandatory common exception and let facultative exception remain? and how to select the mandatory common exceptions and uh, uh, to make the discrepancy the distinction between them. 
what are the uh, elements of the uh, European Court of Justice case law that we can take into account in defining our new strategy for uh, exceptions, the margin of maneuver of the member states. At the moment, as someone said yesterday, it's not a tragedy, but it's a little bit confusing because exceptions are being considered by the European Court of Justice as being autonomous concept and the members that are in a bit of a schizophrenic situation where they can still choose exceptions but they don't have the possibility to interpret the scope of the exception in a manner that would conflict with the well past interpretation of the European Court of Justice. That's right, but the forthcoming, the, the one we will see after, and uh, the preliminary ruling decision as a retroactive effect. So it's very uncertain at this point. So uh, what happened when the scope of the exception is somewhere in the middle between two exceptions of the list, we've seen that yesterday with the Wege vote and the German system between cop, uh, private copying and reprography. Um, what about the cooperation between the member states uh, for the compensation as regards private copying? The uh, Opus decision saying, well, you have to pay there, but uh, but, but it's at the final place where the, the private copying is made that you have to pay it. If you have paid before, then you can get a refund. But it's, well, you know, what is the effectivity? As a consumer, will I, ha will I really ask the refund? Will I know how to do? Will I process that? It's very complicated. Way forward. Unification of the exception for all kinds of work unless precise. We can say, well, in the future directive and assuming this uh, common, common law, uh, common droit commun of the copyright uh, rule of the InfoSec directive, well, well, the list of exception is worse for every kind of work, notwithstanding the other uh, directive, unless it has been, it is precise that it is not the case. We may make a short list of mandatory exception with a precise wording as a maximum harmonization and defining the concept of cross-border effect, quantitative threshold and centralization of compensation. And provide for a clause for national exception uh, subject to the condition that those exceptions are not overlapping within the EU mandatory exception and do not conflict with free movement of goods and services and are consistent with the three-step test. Second point, and I'm going very quickly now. What is the incentive to change the exception? We, have, we are going under an ongoing pressure to implement fair use clauses, uh, blah, blah, blah. And there is a, an instrumentalization of the freedom of expression for some intermediaries that are pushing f to adopt exception only to relieve their costs, to uh, alleviate their costs. And we shall not be naive with this, uh, these questions. But we have also maybe to answer to the legitimate request of the citizens based on public interest as uh, uh, Severine and Thomas will address this uh, question. So we have to make this assessment as regards the uh, economic impact, the cultural impact of the exceptions. Um, market failure, do exclusive rights really hinder digital cross-border market? Is, ex is exception the proper answer or shall we only implement compulsory licensing, mandatory collective management solution? What about the compensation? Um, access to knowledge, to culture. Shall right older bear the cost of this access to knowledge despite they have a right to monetize the access to their work? And freedom of exception, <laughs> how do we implement digital right to quotation or equivalent. As regards transformative use, very quickly, uh, 
well, if, if we go through, can we rely on existing exceptions? Uh, what is the economic impact of the user-generated content? What will be the scope of an exception? The claim is any kind of use. Uh, any kind of use is not a sustainable claim because it uh, does not match with the uh, three-step test because you don't have any board of the definition of the exception, meaning that you don't have exclusive right anymore. But we might maybe restrain it to certain cases, like creation of a work deriving from a mass of previous works that are not by themselves the subject of the UCG. Because here you deal with the fact that it's not possible for a single amateur person to ask for tons of authorization. And this is because of that, that it's not possible, because of the quality of the user, because of the mass of the authorization, the transactional costs are not relevant for the operation. So here you can <coughs> imbalance in the drafting. Uh, but most of the time, the claim is, well, let's do this exception. But the, the, the way those UCG are uh, communicated to the public is through platforms, platforms that advertise uh, the content. But platforms are hosters, so they are not supposedly communicate the content to the public as regards the e-commerce directive, uh, uh, e directive. So how we can manage with this problem? Uh, wouldn't be possible to think that exception is not the proper answer uh, because there will be a loss of a market for the right holder if you define the scope of the UCG too broad and that there is commercial exploitation of the UCG throughout the platform that are not the one that are according to the um, copyright rules, the one that communicate to the public. So maybe an answer would be, well, there's an exclusive right, but the user cannot ask for permission because it's too complicated, but the platform can, because it's the one that benefits from this flow of information, flow of cultural dissemination. So maybe in the general, uh, in the, uh, general condition of use of the platform, there might be another kind of rule coming from consumers' policy saying, well, as an amateur, I'm a consumer, more or less, and I'm, I cannot deal with these questions of asking for permission, for authorization. But, but the platform can for me. So I mandate, I ask in, in, the, in my contract to the platform to represent me, to ask permission for what I'm doing. And this is a way to imply the intermediaries in the circuit of remuneration that cannot be sustained if you think that it's an exception for user-generated content, because here you need for the delegation, for the mandate, to decide that there's exclusive right on the user-generated content. Very, very quickly, and to end with, uh, effectiveness of the exception. Once you have chosen an exception, I was one still, still one minute and it's, uh, it's over, um, you have to be on in line with your choice. I mean, um, you have to make sure that the benefit of the exception will effectively be granted to the user. <coughs> Sometimes we cannot achieve that through copyright rules. Shall we think about a right to access to culture that would be outside the copyright rules and that would be opposable to copyright rules, like defining a directive on the intellect intellectual public domain, for example. Ooh. <laughs> but but, um, but we might say that if we, we are uh, playing outside the scope of the copyright directive, we shall nevertheless be consistent with our international obligation and say that if there is a limitation or an exception, something which is equivalent to it, even though it's not in the text, dedicated text to copyright, but it has the same effect 
as a limitation or an exception, then it must be complying with the three-step test. Last but not least, if you are shaping the exception, you must make sure that uh, there will be an effective benefit. So we have to clarify uh, the distinction between limitations and exception. Uh, Thomas said it later uh, previously, and, and it's uh, very, very urgent after the Vege Vort mess. I guess that not a lot of us here do understand what is at stake in this distinction. And yet the Court of Justice has uh, decided a very different regime depending on the qualification of limitation or exceptions. And I still don't know among the list of the Article 5 which are the exceptions and which are the limitations. It's really very uh, troublesome. Uh, we have to define clearly if the, sec the exception is compulsory public order or not, as uh, Thomas said. And that must be clear in the wording of the exception. Can we or not make a contract which would limit or reduce the exercise or uh, accompany the exercise of the exception in a certain way or not? Uh, we shall forbid the price for the copy plus compensation system. Because here again, the Court of Justice is deciding weird thing at the moment. And there is a double pay. You pay for the copy with your contract, but you will also pay for compensation. This is weird. And uh, we have to recast the balance between exception and, and technical protection measure. And if we have an exception, make sure that the technical protection measure uh, does not impede the access which is necessary for having the benefit of the exceptions. This is the sixth paragraph four article has to be recasted. And last but not least, there shall be no possibility of further control by technical protection measure which are not the one of the right holders, but the one that are granted by the platforms. Because most of the time, the way you use the work is decided not by the right holders, by the platform. And the platform is putting some, its own DRMs, which are not consistent or maybe not consistent with the willingness of the right holders to provide authorization. So the law is the law of the platforms, but we might make a rule saying that no technical protection measure might uh, uh, impede the effective benefit of the license or of the exception granted throughout the copyright exceptions. Then some elements of thought, uh, and it's okay, <laughs> it's over for me. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. May, maybe there is um, any question to to, to, to Professor Benabou, or we will then ask questions afterwards in the presentation part. I've been told that there is coffee already, and I think it would be better to have now coffee break for a half an hour, and then we will proceed with the last presentation and just afterwards start our discussion part. So please enjoy your coffee.